Divine Truth Assistance Group Group Assistance Sessions Putting Principles of Divine Truth into Action This recording is from the Understanding God's Loving Laws Group and is part of an Education in Love series. In the Fundamental Facts Question and Answer presentation, Jesus answers questions from the audience about the material covered in the previous presentation, Fundamental Facts. Recorded on the 19th of November, 2016, in New Seville, Queensland, Australia. This uh, topic of this discussion is Fundamental Facts Q&A. What we'd like to do is, where's Luli? You're over there, Luli. Can I have a mic with Luli on that side? And um, where's Eloisa? She's down the front. Can't go to her just yet. Um, Nikki's up that side. Everyone's on my left. Karen Henry, where are you, Karen? Up the left too. Okay, it looks like left it is. Tess, where are you? Left as well. <laughs> okay, let's start with Lily then. Uh, there's a few questions. Yes, I want to start with question number two and question number four that you had. Okay. Do different laws have different parts of God's personality in them? And if so, could you give some examples? Um, the answer to that question is no. Every law has every part of God's personality in them. <laughs> All right. So, so no, there's no such thing as a, a law having different parts of God's personality in it. They all have an, all of God's personality, fractions of all of God's personality in them. In terms of some examples, you'll see examples through the week. So I'll leave the examples part for, for that discussion. Your next question is question four that I'd like to answer. Um, when you become at one with God, that question, yes? Yes. When you become at one with God, is that when you're now living in harmony with all of God's laws? Yes, interestingly. You don't know all of God's laws, but you are living in harmony with all of them. Why do you reckon that might be the case? Uh, because you know the principles? No. Because you don't know all the principles. There's an infinite number of principles, potentially. You're living in harmony with what you feel from God's personality. God's love enters you, transforms your nature and personality to be in harmony with God's personality. So therefore, you automatically live in harmony with laws because you've received that part of God's personality. Fast way of living in harmony with the laws, right? Yeah, can you see its advantage? Yeah, the advantages are starting to knock up now, aren't they, about this receiving God's love thing? <laughs> Does that make sense? That makes sense to you? Yeah. Okay, yes. question number five for you as well. Oh, um, is God growing and changing? And if so, how does this fit with each attribute of God being um, complete and perfect? Uh, can an infinite being grow and change? Well, I was kind of, yeah, like where does Logically, it grow into? You know the logic. What's the logic saying? Can an infinite being grow and change? I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is no. Oh, okay. The answer is no. It's an interesting thing because I asked the audience that in the last group and except for two people, everyone said yes. <laughs> so that, under, that's a, that tells us we don't understand much about God yet, right? The reality is an infinite being cannot grow, right? and does not need to change. It's already infinite. It cannot grow beyond infinite. There's no such thing as growing beyond infinite. So the reality is each, each characteristic and attribute inside of God is complete and perfect because of the fact of infinity, in fact. Does that make sense? Yeah. So, yeah. yeah good question, though, Lily. Um, so let's go now to turn to Eloisa at the front. Maybe if we can have the second mic on that side for this particular thing too. So after that, can I go to Courtney? Um, wherever Courtney is, where are you? Yep, so, so you'll be after Eloisa, Courtney. Eloisa, can I have your second question? Okay. Just a, sorry, I didn't Which is that three in. questions in one, yep. by the looks. Um, so it's how, the how did God come into existence? Yes, I don't know. Okay. Um, <laughs> how, was it, how is God created? I don't know. Uh, <laughs> Oh, no, I might have changed that, that, it. That was it. That was Does the it? one. <laughs> cool. that very brief answers. It's great. <laughs> <Can you see? laughs> Thank you. Now, what I'm illustrating there to you is that there are things you're never going to know. And, and that's part of this process. Now, God obviously, by the time we've found out one with God, God can begin sharing uh, information about these subjects. But can you see that the information about God's very existence must be, must be such a complex question in its uh, complex answer in itself 
that that we would need to have uh, we would need to have uh, had close to an infinite amount of expansion to understand the answer so so this is why nobody at this stage nobody in the universes of which there are many um, knows the answer to those two questions nobody thank right? you yeah. okay your next question was uh, are there infinite principles like infinite laws Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't number, Jesus. Sorry, yep. And I'm all over the place. Now. All right, well, I'll say them. Thank you. Are there infinite principles like infinite laws? Well, yes, we've answered that yes, question. Yes. And are all laws pre-made? No. The potential for all laws is pre-made. Interesting. Right? All laws are not pre-made because there might be matter that as yet does not exist that may come into existence and therefore will need new laws to govern it. But the potential for the matter to commingle and create and the laws to commingle and create new laws that govern that matter have all been pre-made. Isn't that incredible yeah. as a concept that you don't pre that God hasn't pre-made the law, God pre-made the potential for the law to be made. <laughs> now I've actually experienced that in my life with the creation of the spheres because I've been the pers first person that's entered each new sphere the condition of my of getting into a new condition of a new sphere has meant that a whole set of laws were created for that sphere to exist and and that was created through the exercise of my will and desire to to get into the appropriate condition for that to occur and in that process, all of a sudden, the sphere comes into existence as a physical location. And the potential of that, for that sphere to exist was created by God by pre-making the condition, by, by making the potential for that to occur. It's an, incredible, it's, a, it's an incredibly beautiful thing, actually, because what it does is it allows the, the, any creation, in fact, to commingle with other creations given uh, under certain conditions and the conditions have to be met for the creation to occur and, and it allows for an ever-expanding universe within the infinite. So at this stage the universe is really quite tiny in comparison to God because God being infinite the universe is actually finite. It's not infinite. There's no such thing as an infinite universe actually because if there was God could not exist. Right? The reality is God is infinite, the universe is very small in comparison to God, but God is given the capacity to even create new universes. Spheres are not universes, by the way, they belong to portions of universes, which we'll talk about later. But, but the universes themselves can be created through the fact that God pre-made the potential for new laws to come into existence. And this is where understanding scope, which is going to happen tomorrow, the discussion about scope, is very important. And most of you would have read scope and gone, what the... <laughs> right? <laughs> what? <laughs> you know what I mean? But understanding scope is the key to understanding how that actually occurs. When you made... An, well, when you The conditions were right to make the new sphere. Did you actually experience it, seeing it made? So you actually got an understanding of how God actually makes the law? Well, I couldn't go there unless it's first created. Okay. Does that make sense? Yes. I can't, in the physical form, I can't go there. However, in the soul form, you're already there. So in your soul, if you use your soul perceptions, which include a perception of sight, yep. you can actually see it being made before you get there, based on your actions and desires. That is cool. Now, that's very cool. Yes. And, <laughs> and believe it or not, all of you are already doing it and you don't know because at the moment you have pictures, you have buildings that you're making through your actions that you're taking here on earth and, and you have pictures on the walls of those buildings that you are actually making through your actual activities on earth and they're all being created right now and you'll go there and you'll see there's this house that will belong to you and that you made it through whatever your soul engaged. Now, now, why were you not aware? It's because you're not yet connected to it at the soul level, you see. But if we connect it to it at the soul level, you can actually watch it happening. Yeah, so that's awesome. Yes. <laughs> to, to, to understate matters, yeah. isn't it? 
don't you think? Courtney, can we go to Courtney? Thanks, Courtney. Um, as the universe existed for billions of years before humans, was God planning all along and before it all for it to be primarily for humans as God's highest creation? Yes. The answer to that question is yes. Isn't that fantastic? So you, you imagine the amount of love that God must have for humans, for him to actually plan the entire universal system and even, in fact, all of the law-based system had to be pre-made before the universe even came into existence itself. So God had to pre-make the laws, the potential for the laws to exist. Then the universe could come into existence. And then the universe has been in existence for many, many millions, billions of years before humankind comes into existence. And all of it was done so that the human soul that he'd already created could be injected into the universe and start having this experiential process that, of learning that we currently have. Now that means that God must have a lot of love for us, for God to do all of those things. And to do it over such a long period of time with such patience and care. And the more you examine God's laws, the more you see, man, it's just so infinitely complex and amazing. It's just incredibly amazing. So. Yeah, good question though, Courtney. If we go to back to Nikki on that side and to Monique, um, wherever Monique is, so one, one with Monique and one with Nikki. Thanks. So can we use the feelings we have already received from God, e.g. love, as an instrument, like a measuring stick, <laughs> uh, to understanding God's principles and thus God's laws with continued experimentation? Spot on, yes. That's exactly true. This is how we grow. This is how, in fact, you become at one with God without knowing the principles and the laws, but automatically living in harmony with them. You receive a part of God's very nature and personality, and so this now becomes the measuring stick. So what happens is, you, 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 now that you've received some of God's laws and personality, you start to take an action. If that action's out of harmony with the love that now exists within you, you can't do it. You feel, you feel like you can't do it. It's just a feeling, but you just can't do it. Does that make sense? Yeah. You don't know why you can't do it, because <laughs> it's possible to do. You poss it's possible to use your desire to do it, but you just feel you can't do it. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. Yep. And then there's other things that you go, you go to take an action, and you feel, whew, big rush from God, right? I can do this. So he's, he, he, and you're saying, I don't believe I can do that. But he does, right? So I'll do it. And off you go and do that. Right? And this is how you finish up living in harmony with all of the principles without knowing what they are. And live in harmony with all the laws without knowing what they are. Now, of course, you still haven't discovered them all. And the fascinating thing of life after your at one condition is the process of discovery of them. Because each discovery allows you to do new things that you weren't aware of. See, 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 before then, you're basically being guided by God's feelings. God's saying, go for that, don't go for that. Go for that, don't go for that. That's what God's saying. But you don't know why God's saying it half the time, right? Most of the time, actually, you don't know why God's saying that to you. So you, you just do it because you trust God's goodness, right? But when you start understanding it, you'll go, oh, now I can see all the reasons why God told me that. And, and not only that, I can see that if I engage that law now, there's a whole heap of things God didn't tell me about it either that I can now do. Does that make sense? Yeah. And so it's, a, it's still a very fascinating process of discovery that you engage as a result. Yeah. Good question. Cheers, cheers. Yep. Uh, so, Monique, we're down to you. If we can have your one, two, third question. Uh, sorry, I didn't um, number them either. Uh, why would it be hard... To conceptualise or feel God as having personality, characteristics, attributes, nature and desires. Yes, so why would it be hard to conceptualise or feel that God has personality, characteristics, attributes and desires? It's a good question, Monique. Mm -hmm. Most of you are finding this hard, to conceptualise God as this personal, personable being, given the fact that God's infinite, so uh, you know, how can this be, you know? Now, the reason, there's a number of reasons why it's hard to conceptualise. Firstly, we've had the predisposition, which is really our human hangover, the predisposition from our relationship with our parents to, to not believe that anyone in authority could ever be as good as God is. 
Uh, so we have this preconditioning due to the principles of the world's definition of love being different to God's. We have a preconditioning which basically says, surely God hasn't got personality. Or if God has a personality, surely God's personality is just like my mum and dad's personality. Right? Someone who's flawed with a lot and with a lot of injury. But the second reason why we have this problem is because we've not received some of God's love. When we don't receive some of God's love, you don't feel God as a personable being. You just don't. And it's only those people who feel God as a personable being that actually have received some of God's love. And can you see? This is why I know most of you haven't. Because most of you do not see God that way yet. Right? It's one of the very first things that happens to you when you receive a bit of God's love. You start feeling God as a, as a personable being with personality, characteristics, personal love for you, and, and personal traits, if you like. Infinite in nature, but traits that you can feel and therefore live in harmony with. So some of you have been in a state where you feel that, but most of you are not yet there. And that demonstrates that you've yet to receive God's love. So if you feel you've received God's love, but don't yet have this feeling about God's nature, then that should tell you that you're feeling love from someone else or what you're defining as love from someone else. And what, who's that going to be? Most likely it's going to be spirits feeding your addictions. So the reality is on the earth, the majority of people who say they have a connection with God only have a connection with spirits who are feeding their addictions. Unfortunately. But when you do receive some of God's love, yes, you will feel God to be very different than what you currently feel. Make sense? Yeah. Yep. Perfect. So don't don't get put off by that, but but understand what's going on. There's the there's the love, the human love, and I use love very loosely there, right? Because it's really what did we call it in the second group? Human evil. You know, you could almost say human evil <laughs> instead of evil, right? Uh, is our definition of love. And, and that has a very large impact upon your trust in God's goodness. And, and then secondly, the lack of true passionate desire to connect to God individually has the other, is the other reason why we don't feel God to be this way. Mm -hmm. right? Every single celestial spirit feels God to be mm -hmm. this way. And to be honest with you, even spirits who are in the hills who have received some of God's love feel God to be this way. Mm -hmm. So, and remember, but there are six fear spirits who don't feel God at all. So, so can you see it's all based upon this desire, wanting the relationship, no matter what you condition. Yeah. Yep. Good question though. Thanks, Monique. Now, um, who did I have next? Nobody. Is that right? Okay. Can I go to Lani? Uh, where is Lani? Oh, there she is. Left hand side again. And could I go to Karen, Henry? Karen's up the back, if we could have the other mic up with her. Thanks, Lani. Um, I've lost track of my question. Okay, um, it starts... Uh, oh, you don't know the whole question? Do you want me to... I'll yes, read it? please. How are new laws created every moment? Can you please give examples and how they are under the umbrella of existing laws? Mm. I'm going to give you just a brief example, which we will go further in the scope principle, because the scope principle answers your question in a lot of detail. But let's just give you a very simple example of how a new law is created. It's very simple and quite easy to understand. You've got a, a, an element called hydrogen. You've got an element called oxygen. All right. They have certain principles or laws, laws that govern their properties. So each, each one of these elements have properties. One of the properties is that hydrogen is searching for charges, electrons, and oxygen is searching for a certain commingling. A certain commingling can occur. And it, can, and it occurs by two of them and one of them getting together. And doing a bit of a tango and you've got the new element formed. Right? Now you know what that element is, right? Water. Now, oxygen has its own laws governing it. Hydrogen has its own laws governing it. But the combination of these two laws mixed together to create a law 
that's quite new that governs the new element. Does that make sense? That's an example of a new element being created and new laws governing the element being created. Does that make sense to you? So it's just a very simple example. But that happens, of course, exponentially up and infinitely up and down as well. We'll go through that, though, in more detail in the scope discussion. Does that make sense? But the question that you asked was, are they under the umbrella of existing laws? They're not sort of under the umbrella, are they? They are a commingling of both the element and the properties of the element create the properties of the new law. So you could say the new law is bigger than the individual constituent elements of the underlying components of that law. But they still have the same principle. Uh, no, no. The water has a completely different principles that govern it. Uh, not principles in terms of God's principles. It has completely different uh, properties and therefore completely different internal and external rules that govern its operation. However, it can be broken back down into its constituent elements and those constituent elements will go back to what they were previously, governed by the law that they were governed by previously. Does that make sense? Yeah. Vaguely. Anyways, yes. it, it gets quite complicated, but we'll talk more about that in scope. <laughs> but I just wanted to give you a bit of a heads up with that yeah. in that, yeah. in, Thank in you. that question. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, if we go up to uh, Karen. Thanks, mm -hmm. Karen. Uh, it's number two, if I could have from you. Okay, why are they called foundation principles? Could you possibly expand on the definition of a foundation principle? Yeah, good question. This group, this, uh, these two days coming up, so the next uh, presentation and, and other presentations over this next two days, we're going to be focusing on what we've called foundation principles. We're calling them foundation principles because they are the top of the hierarchy of many of the principles, and particularly the first two, love and truth, are the top of the hierarchy. But, but they also form, if you like, a base layer upon which everything else is built. So you could think of it like this. You've got your foundation principles, which is like a foundation of a building. You follow me? And then we've got built on top of that the order principles. These cannot exist unless these existed before them. Does that make sense? They cannot exist without these. You follow? And then we've got the soul specific principles, which relate to the human. So, you follow? Yes. And it forms basically a building, if you like, a structure via which the human, in, in, in this case, lives and breathes and exists. So you can see that without the foundation principles, the order principles couldn't exist. And without the order principles, the soul specific principles could not exist. And that's why we've labelled them in that way. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so please understand again, though, that God doesn't label them this way. <laughs> it's just a way that we've labelled them to help your understanding to see that some principles require other principles or use other principles for their existence. And the, the higher the principle is in hierarchy, the more principles it combines in order to exist. Just like the higher the law in hierarchy, like the law governing water, is higher in hierarchy than the individual laws that govern oxygen and hydrogen by themselves. Do you follow? Yeah. So, so each new higher law has higher complexity and higher governance principles. It, it governs more things. It has more of an effect on its, on its environment. So these are just some basic things that we'll be introducing to you over the next couple of days. Does that make sense? Yes, yeah. thank you. Yep, yeah, good. Day. How am I going? Uh, it's by end of my time. Now, wasn't that great? We got to answer quite a few principles, uh, questions. Oh, I want to ask, answer one more if I can. Um, can we go to Pierre? Where's Pierre? Sorry, there you go. Um, I'd like to answer your one, two, three, four, fifth question, if I could, Pierre, if you've got yes. 
a record of those. Sorry, mate, to put you on the spot there. Oh, I don't find the fifth. <laughs> it's is oh fourth. Sorry, is oh. your understanding? Oh yeah. One. Is your understanding of God's laws and principle a result of God's gifts uh, that come along with the reception of God's love and discovery? Or is it the exercise of your will and desire uh, toward uh, understanding God's uh, principle and laws in particular? Yeah, so this is an interesting question. What Basically the question is what comes first, your understanding or God's love or is it reception of God's love that causes understanding or so forth? As I stated to Nikki in his previous question, it's not that we understood God's laws and principles as a, re as a result of God's love. When you receive God's love and you trust God, you automatically live in harmony or, or you can choose also to live out of harmony, but it's very hard because it feels against what God is telling you to do. So you automatically live in harmony with the laws and principles without knowing them. So, so the question then becomes, how do you come to know them? You, if you're living in harmony with these laws and principles without knowing them, how do you come to know them? Obviously, you've got to discover them. Does that make sense? Just like any other process. However, there's one, uh, you could say, additional element that's involved in the discovery process, and that is God's leading you towards discovery, a fuller discovery and a fuller understanding of the law or principle by the reception of God's love and by acting in harmony with the law, you're now starting to expand your soul. As a result of your soul expanding, you have now the capacity to, not, to conceptualize the law and also then discover its operation that you didn't have before, a capacity that you didn't have before. Now, this means then that it's not actually the reception of God's love that causes you to automatically understand the law. The reception of God's love causes you to automatically do what the law says to do without understanding it. D does everyone get that? But the understanding of it still has to be a will-based process that you, uh, a desire-based process in fact, that you engage. But it's helped by the fact that your soul is now expanded and able to conceptualize the possibility of these things existing that you didn't conceptualize could exist before. Does that make sense to you? Yeah. So it's actually quite an interesting process in terms of your future, in terms of discovering the application of these laws. You could say, in a lot of ways, it's exactly the way a scientist would discover a law on Earth, in a way, isn't it? He's had to open his mind enough to conceptualize that perhaps there's some mathematical thing governing this process, some permanent thing, some predictable thing that's, d that's involved in this process. Right? And through some experimentations, he realized, oh, that's interesting. It's like with the law of gravity. You know, most people thought that if something was really big and something was really small, the bigger thing would fall faster. Right? And in fact, even today, you go around and ask the average person, They'll tell you the bigger thing will fall faster, right? But the law says that that's not the case. Now, what they did had, had to do some experiments. So first they had to have the imagination of, and, and so, you know, the whole Newton's apple thing, you know, where the apple fall in his head, well, what's going on here? That kind of thing. Well, obviously that's not probably how it happened, right? It's just a, <laughs> it's a very simple, simple way of looking at what Newton must have felt and thought and whatever else. But, but the reality is he had a, he had a, had, a, had, some, had to have an opening of his awareness to the point where he could experiment with the law and determine its principles. And what I'm suggesting to you is that many of these laws, the opening of awareness is going to be through the requirement of receiving God's love because you're not going to have an opening of awareness otherwise. Right? But don't think that the receiving of God's love automatically means you'll understand the law it will open you up to the concept of the law, but God's still saying, you can discover it, you can work with it, you can learn it. Right? And if you have a fascination of discovery and learning, then of course you'll do that. If not, then you'll just be a slower, because God will have to say, do this, do that, do this, through the operation of God's love. And then as you engage God's love in that way, you'll learn more and more and eventually understand the law. So, so you can do both, can't you? Yeah.
It's a very powerful uh, way. And does every celestial spirit has the same desires, but it's kind of you had the stronger desires that you, you went a bit faster? No, every person has different desires. In fact, this is one of the things we would like to talk to you about near the end of our group with the desire principle, because every single person has different desires and every single person has a different level of desire. So, so the reality is, remember I said to you last night, that unless you have a desire that's out of harmony with your current condition, and that applies after you've at one with God, by the way, you can be at one with God and then decide, I'm not going to have any more desires. Well, good luck with that. It's probably <laughs> unlikely you'll choose to do that, but, but you could theoretically choose that, I'm not going to have any more desires. And if you have no more desires after you become at one with God, then what will happen is you'll not make any further progress. Because every person who has no desire out of harmony, any, that does not have a desire in har out of harmony with their current condition, will not grow. So unless your desire is different to your current condition, you will not grow. So the difference between myself and most of the others is I have very strong desire, as you now probably might be gathering, um, and therefore my growth you, you ends up oftentimes being faster than other people in different areas. Does that make sense? But you've got all the same capacity to have the same level of desire, even stronger than mine perhaps. I don't know. Desire is your, your key of something you need to develop, you see. Hmm. Good questions. Thanks, guys. Well, there's uh, yeah, six, five or six pages of questions there. Obviously, I only managed to answer a few. But you can see that with this format, we get to answer them quite quickly. Eh? And therefore, it becomes an interesting discussion. All right. Well, thank you for your time. That's our fundamental facts Q&A finished, completed. And what we'll do now is have a 10 minute break if we come, past, uh, come back at 15 past 12 and uh, we'll get started on the first two principles, love and truth.